Mary Ellen Carsley is a scientific and botanical illustrator, as well as an art educator. A former practicing architect, she has illustrated eight books and numerous articles for national and international journals. Her works have been included in the collections of the National Building Museum and the Library of Congress. She is a member of the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, Maryland Federation of Art, the Art League at the Torpedo Factory, Washington Calligraphers Guild, and the Guild of Book Writers, Workers. We are very excited to have Mary Ellen here today to teach us how to draw cacti and succulents using colored pencil. So with that, over to you, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much, Libby. It's great to be here and welcome to my studio. And thank you for inviting me into your studio today. So we're gonna get started right away um, because we have a lot to go through in the next 90 minutes. The first thing is a logistical point. I wanted to familiarize, your, to familiarize you with my website because today you won't have to worry about taking any notes or, um, or anything like that. I'm gonna share my screen with you for a moment so I can show you uh, what my website looks like and where you can find information about today's class. And this right here, okay, if you go to my website, which is uh, maryellencarsley.com, you click on more and go to botanical art workshops, you'll see right at the top of the page, if you're looking for drawing cacti and succulents with colored pencil, you go ahead and scroll on down and you'll be able to find our, and to find our class. So when you look at, uh, when you look at the class references, you're going to notice that there is a slideshow uh, that I'll be going, and this is gonna be basically all of your notes. The slideshow also has um, my email. One of the things I'm fond of telling my new students is, is that once you've had me as a teacher, you now have me for life. So feel free to email me your questions and uh, your drawings if you would like some feedback about them anytime in the future. Everything that we're going to go through is here for you today. So again, and also if you scroll down, you'll notice there's an image gallery as well as there is an example of a colored pen of a flower and colored pencil in process. And I'll also be posting what we create today uh, in class uh, right after right after our time together. So you have an opportunity to see uh, to see exactly what we did here today. So um, that's everything that we've got there. Okay, terrific. So now we'll have a chance to get started and I'm gonna switch my camera now. So you'll be looking, instead of seeing me, you'll see, you'll see me in one of the smaller screens, but you'll now be able to look at my desktop. So what I have here today is, I wanted to show you what my desktop looks like and what you have available. This was the, this was the kit that I recommended that you get. Uh, the, the Prismacolor, this is the Botanical Garden set. This tends to have the greens and the reds that you need to do for, but that you, you'll need to um, draw botanical subjects in colored pencil, but any set of colored pencils will, will, work, will work fine. We'll talk a little bit more about those materials because I like to make sure that students understand exactly what they're using because with that knowledge of your materials and your equipment you're better able to uh to use it in order to create the artistic effects that you want you'll notice that i already have my pencils separated out here because i've started creating a palette for myself i'm going to set this tin aside for now and so some of the other equipment that you're going to want to have is you'll want to have a uh you'll you'll want to have a uh, pink pearl eraser and uh, which is just your standard uh your standard eraser then also the light white eraser okay this is for erasing more or less smudges this one's for kind of a full eradication and uh then you'll also something that's handy to have is a little sanding block uh with some with some light grit sandpaper on it. This is for manipulating the shape of the tip of your pencil, which can be, which can be helpful. 
I, I prefer using just a hand pencil sharpener. One of the things you'll notice about my pencil sharpener is that it has two diameters. The first one is for the standard size pencil, and the second one is for those larger uh, colored pencils, particularly the Derwent Cumberland brand. They tend to be a little bit bigger, a, a little rounder barrel, and so you can put them in the larger, in that larger one as well. I usually have a small glass bowl to catch my shavings and uh, and the crumbs, so they don't uh, so they don't make everything messy on my table. And then you'll notice that I've already started to arrange for our example today, our palette. So this is a typical, pro a, a typical practice that I have where I start to set my palette right away. And our palette being those, choice, those co colors that we're going to go back to over and over again. Now, many of you have lots of experience, but some of you are going to be beginners for the first time. So I like to gear my lectures toward beginners. And then I know some of it will be review for our more experienced folks, but I, but I also um, hope that our more experienced folks will pick up a few tips that they hadn't thought about or hadn't considered. Besides your colored pencils, your sanding block, your sharpener, your erasers, um, other things that, I, that are handy to have is a pad of tracing paper. Uh, I always like to, like to have this handy and I'll show you how we use that later. And then the next thing we have is our paper. So the paper that came with your, uh, with your kit was the Strathmore uh, paper. If you didn't buy this, that's fine. But you're going to notice that uh, this paper is acid-free. That's really important to get acid-free paper. It means that it won't yellow. It also says that it has a medium surface on it, which that refers to is the tooth of the paper. The paper itself has a texture to it. And this is a, this, you'll notice that uh, oftentimes with paper, They'll talk about hot press, cold press, and they'll also uh, talk about rough and smooth or plate. And so you can see that the paper that is that makes up the cover actually has, you can see in the reflection of the light, actually has a little bit of bumpiness to it, okay? So this is what we call a toothed paper. It's not a smooth paper. The paper inside, you'll notice when you feel it is quite smooth, okay? And that paper is perfect for our watercolor paper, for our, uh, for our colored pencil today. And it also has a little bit of thickness to it, okay? So this is a, um, a medium weight paper. And, uh, and you'll find that, uh, that paper, typically, this is what's referred to as 100 pound paper. Now, paper's thickness and it can be quite confusing. What the 100 pounds refers to, it's an interesting unit of measure. The 100 pound refers to a 20 by 30 inch sheet, 100 pages of it stacked up weighs 100 pounds. That's how they measure the thickness of paper. But you'll, you'll see that it's, uh, it's thicker than copier paper, but not as thick as cardboard, okay? So it's a nice, has a nice weight to it, and it's not particularly rough, but it's not slick either. And so that makes it really nice to catch our colored pencil pigment. Now, as I mentioned, our colored pencils, in order to understand how they work and to use them up to their best, to their best abilities, it's good to understand what they're composed of. So a colored pencil has a wooden body to it, and inside that pencil, there is a um, there there is a core that's composed of binder and pigment. So the binder is slightly sticky. So something to keep in mind with colored pencils is that the more friction or the more force you apply, the the stickier you will make that binder. When it cools, it becomes very, very difficult to manipulate. So this is why you'll hear me mentioning throughout our time together that you wanna keep a nice light hand and you wanna layer the pencil. So by doing that, you know, you really want to start light. And I'll put my 
glasses on here because I recently graduated to big girl glasses. Those of you of a certain age will know exactly what I mean when I say that. So I'm, I'm wearing it as a badge of honor. So you'll notice that I worked both vertically and then in order to increase the intensity of the hue, okay, I work horizontally, but I am not bearing down on the pencil. Okay, so that's all of our materials. Oh, and there's one last one that's very, very handy to have. This is what's called a blender, okay? The blender is actually pure binder and it has absolutely no pigment in it. Now, I'll zero my camera down in just for a moment here so you can see the difference of, so in this area here, when I use the blender, you can see the wonderful effect that it has. It smooths out that area very, very nicely like that. So now that we've gone through all of our materials, I'm going to, I'm going to, come back for just a quick moment here. So now when it comes to various techniques, today what we're going to be using is, and I'm going to uh, share my screen one more time. So we're gonna go to uh, back to my website where we're gonna be using this and here. Mayor yeah. Ellen, while you're doing that, there was a question here. This uh, person was not able to get a blender. Can they oh. complete the class today without it? Yes, they can. As a matter of fact, I'll show you some tricks that you can do when you don't have a blender, so it's not a problem. So, so don't worry about that. Now, the other thing that I wanted just to make sure that, uh, and again, here on our on our techniques here, and also on our medium, uh, we've I've got some some other some more information here for you. And if you're interested on in how colored pencils are made, I even have a link to a video for you about that. Um, and so there's all our information about our media. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some basic techniques. Now today, what we're going to I'm going to focus completely on using just the colored pencils themselves, and and with a little bit of the blender. Uh, and we're going to talk about doing the light layering of color, the altering of the pencil tip with sandpaper, and also uh, what we can do if we work with different uh, paper textures as well as blender. Today, I will not be covering the use of solvents, okay? But I do want you to be aware of that, that that is out there, that colored pencils actually can be manipulated by using mineral spirits. And when you do that, when you use mineral spirits, you're gonna notice that you get a kind of watercolor effect. They're also very similar. Uh, the mineral spirits makes a very similar effect as it does with the water, the water soluble colored pencils. But we're not going to be using that today, but I do like to make you aware that those techniques are out there. And I'm happy to talk with anybody who has more experience um, talking about how to use those, any questions that you might have and having tried that. So I'm gonna switch back down oh, to- Oh, yes. Mary Ellen, while you're, while you're up there, uh, we did have somebody asking about uh, referencing pencils by numbers. Do oh. you- Oh, by the, oh, okay. So the numbers, are they referring to now, most companies, and let me switch my camera down so we can look up close at some pencils here. There we go. Most companies will have their company name on there, and then they'll oh, have- You're going to have to pull it down. There you go. There Thank you. Go. Sorry about that. <laughs> they, will have the, they will have a pencil that this is actually refers to the color number. Now, colored pencils um, do not have, they are not like drawing pencils, whereas when I have a drawing pencil, you'll notice this is a 2B pencil, which refers to the hardness of the lead. Okay, so this is that, this is a very soft drawing pencil, which means that it will blend very, very easily. Um, and, uh, and so, and if I were to use a 2H, that would be a harder pencil that would not blend very easily and make a very, very light line. This makes a darker line. The colored pencils, the numbers on the end of those refer to the company's code for that particular pigment. So if you particularly liked this Prismacolor 
uh, that was a spring green, you would want to get this. They might have more than one called spring green, and you would want to refer to that number directly. Okay, so all of those have that all the companies would have a different number. You'll notice here's a Derwent Cumberland one. They have a code number on the end of it as well with the with the the name of the color. So so those are simply to refer to the pigment and not the hardness. But that does bring up a very good issue. So one of the things I'll I'll show you here is, and this is something that you really different brands of colored pencils will have a different feel now the derwent cumberland pencils are very what i refer to as cream. mary ellen if you are drawing right now we cannot see you drawing. okay oh thank you yeah. I appreciate uh -huh. that. <laughs> thank you so you'll notice that um they, this goes on the I, I i'm using this a very very light pressure but you'll notice that i get a lot of color these tend to be, the Derwent Cumberland tend to be a bit softer, and what I refer to as kind of creamy, they want to blend really easily with that. Prismacolors are a little bit harder, um, and that, uh, and you'll want to use them to be, uh, you'll, you'll find that you'll need to do a little more layering with them to get them to be, as, uh, to get them to be the intense hue that that particular pigment is is capable of doing. Now you'll notice that I use the. I'm very careful about using that term about hue and color and and things because we're going to start to drift into some basic color theory here. And so I'm going to push my make sure my pad is here. You'll also notice that on my website you've got a color wheel and uh, to have that handy. And you can feel free to print out any of these, uh, any of the handouts or pictures that I have there, they're, they're for your use. So when we think about basic color theory, we wanna remember that there's three primary colors. You'll notice the colors that I've used today are actually from our Prismacolor kit. So we have red, yellow, and blue. They're referred to as the primaries because they are irreducible, right? They're, and all the other colors are made from them. Our secondaries are orange, green, and purple. And remember, orange is red plus yellow, and then green, yellow, plus blue, and purple is blue plus red. Now, because some of us are familiar with decorator colors or uh, cosmetic colors and things like that, the word tint and shades can be quite confusing. But when we're talking about this in the visual arts, they mean very, very specific things. So a tint of a color, okay, is, and when we talk about the pure hue, that would be what I was just mentioning, that is, that is this color, it's referred to as pomegranate, okay, as a, that's our red that we have for this. So that is our, our pure hue. And then as it, as we add white to it, we can add white in two ways. We can literally add white, and this is where we get to that colored pencil. I, for the blender, we could actually literally add white pencil to it to lighten it up, okay? Or you'll notice that when I originally did this, I started out with an intense color, and then I work lighter and lighter, allowing the white of the paper to show through. So we can add white to create a tint of the hue in two ways, by literally adding white or by allowing the color of the paper, uh, of our white paper to show through. Now shades are different. Shades are a darker hue, and we get shades by adding the opposite color. Now this for many, many people is counterintuitive, but if we want to get a darker red, we are going to add green to it. And you have this color wheel here to help you out to remember your opposite. Always remember opposite colors tend to be, have the most intense contrast. So yellow and purple, red and green, orange and blue. And so if I have my red and I wanna make a darker red with it. So I'm going to start with 
my original hue here. And if I want this to become darker, I'm going to add, I'm going to progressively add green to it, but not so much green. It gets a little bit of a knack to it. You don't want to add so much green that you see the green. You want it to work into the red. And you'll notice that I do, this is that layering technique. I'm going vertical and then horizontal and layering on top of each one. And notice that I'm getting a lovely darker hue of that same red by adding the opposite. Now, to enhance this, I can add, I can continue to add red to layer that and to make it even smoother. Suppose I had a very smooth petal that I had a dark shadow on and that's how, let me bring that camera down a little bit so you can see that. And that's how I would get that darker hue. Now we can also cool it with a little bit of a, of a slate blue. Just bluing up that green is what we're doing. Notice we're going to get a nice, nice, but this is still very, very much on that purplish red side. Now, the blender, we can go through, and that blender is adding more binder and therefore mixing up all those tiny pigment particles even more so that we get a very, very smooth effect with that. So those are our techniques that we have. They're very, very basic. Um, now you'll see that I, right now, I have some, and I'm gonna pull out just a little bit. I have some rather short, um, some short leads on here. I, if I know that I'm gonna be doing some more detailed areas, I'm gonna get a, a, a longer lead with that. I'm gonna keep that nice sharp point. I do know that I'm gonna be doing some, uh, I'm gonna be having some big green areas. So one of the things that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a nice, a nice uh, long lead there. And then I'm gonna flatten out the end of that, that, uh, that lead just a little bit. So I have a nice wide surface when I start to put down my, uh, when I start to put down my color there for the, for the leaves that I'm gonna be using. Now, let's get started. Let's get started doing some drawing. We've got everything prepped. Yeah, can I ask you a really quick question? Sure. As, sure. as you're prepping and getting ready to start drawing? Yeah. You need, you need to also clean the blender. Oh, to clean it. You know, um, that's a great, that's a great observation. Yes, I will, you'll notice that some of the tip is, has some of the red on there. So that's, again, just use your sandpaper or you can use a scrap sheet of paper if you don't have any sandpaper and take that color off. And then that way you won't have to worry about contaminating it. Great question. And the same would actually go for your white as well. You definitely want to get the white. That's a, that's a terrific question. Thank you for stopping me on that. Now, you're gonna notice that, now I'm gonna set all of this aside. We've got our techniques. Remember, light hand, that's what we wanna do today. And so some of you might be new to drawing and it might be very, very intimidating to think about drawing, um, especially our subject that we're focusing on today. So cacti and succulents. Now, succulent comes from the Latin word, uh, in, it actually refers to juice or sap. And succulents, they actually have a, and as a matter of fact, I have some, some little buddies here. I'm gonna bring them into the camera so we can look at real succulents today. There they are. And I'll pull them, pull back just a little bit so you can see them. You're going to notice that they are, succulents are characterized by having these very, very fleshy leaves. 
And so, and those, those fleshy leaves are filled with fluid and that actually allows the plant to endure more arid soil or a more arid environment. Now, most cacti are succulents, not, but not all of them are, and, and all succulents are not cacti. Now, cacti have a very, very unique, um, they have a very unique quality to them. And here's my other little friend. I'm going to bring him over here. It's a little, little cacti that very, very common we see in, uh, in the store. And uh, so you'll notice that it has the ridges here, which act as the storage area for the fluid for the plant, but also it has spines on it. Cacti actually have a structure that's different. They have a structure called an aerial, and in the aerial, it acts as a little tube, and from that tube grows the spines that protect the plant. Um, and also, uh, what from those from that uh, tube also uh, emerges the flowers. Now, succulents are a little bit they operate they flower in a different way. Okay, they have a, a flowering stem that emerges from the center of the plant or from the in, in, closer towards the center of the plant as well. So they're slightly different from the two. But what we're thinking about as artists when we look at these two plants, as I said, you don't have to be like, we don't have to be a chemist to understand our, our colored pencils, but it's important to understand the basics of how they're put together so we use them well. The same thing of our subject. We under, want to understand the basic structure, habit, and uh, and also the environment of the plant, so that we can portray it with some with some realism and some sensitivity. So I'm going to put our I put our examples aside here because you probably already noticed that I have handy some photographs. Now, like all like all art teachers. I'm going to emphasize that it's always best to work from life. You always best to draw from life. But I know that as a beginner, it is extremely intimidating to try to draw from life. And especially when you're on your own, it's you feel it's easy to become overwhelmed and to begin to feel lost. So what we're going to do today, you're going to notice that on the website, I have taken some pictures of uh, of my cacti you also notice how i started to set my palette that i was actually using that photograph to help me find the pencils that i would be using okay so today the pencils that i'm going to be using just so you know and you can start to have them out especially those those of you who have a little more experience and some of this this part will be a little bit of review um, I'm going to bring my pencils down so you can see. I have the, I, from, and this is, these are from the Prismacolor kit. I have the Dahlia purple. Okay. I have the, uh, the yellow. I also have the pomegranate. I have the spring green. The olive. Okay. And I also have the, uh, this is the blue slate. I'm very fond of this color for cooling colors down and we'll talk more about what that means in a minute. Now, I also have a couple of other th colors here that I have from my own uh, colored pencil collection. I have a ochre, uh, a yellow ochre here. And then this is a, an, um, this one here is more of a brown ochre, okay, some earth tones, so any earth tones would work. Um, this is a color that I refer to, this is a, uh, a, a this is a, winch, a it's a uh, water green from Derwent Cumberland as well. You don't need to have this, but I have these handy because I have an idea about how I wanna alter some of these colors. Um, you may have some extra colored pencils, Otherwise, we can do everything with what we need to do with the kit that you have. And so don't worry about it. I'm just showing you some of the things that I use to, to work with. And then um, with these, I have, I'm going to set those aside. I do have a white pencil 
And I have handy a 2B pencil, and I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna use that. Generally, we don't wanna use graphite pencils with colored pencils, but I'll show you how I use it, especially for those beginners out there about how you're gonna get started. So one of the things that I, that I like to recommend to beginners is, uh, Obviously, you want to practice drawing from life, and we are going to start uh, with a drawing, okay? I, I'll show you how to get started drawing from life. But for but if you're feeling like it's just so overwhelming and you don't know really what to do, let's look at a photograph that we took. Now, when you're working from photographs, you always want to work from your own picture because you composed it. This is an image that you composed just as you would have composed an image on your own in your sketchbook. So work from your own photograph, print it out. I like to make sure that I print it out to the size of my page. That's what I like to recommend to people to do that. So then we don't have to worry about making things bigger or smaller or anything like that. We can save that for when we have a little more experience. And then what I do is, take that tracing paper. Remember I mentioned that it's very, very useful. And you can see what I did, and I'm gonna remove that. I traced it, and then I made basically a, basically think about as if it's a coloring book picture for yourself. I traced it with a thin, with a, a thin felt tip marker, okay? And you're gonna notice that this picture is a little different from this one. And I'm gonna pull that camera out a little bit there so you can see how they're different. So, and what I did was I made those choices. I changed this slightly from this because I wanted my, I, I wanted my camera, there we go, there. I want my camera nice and lined up there. I wanted to compose a slightly different composition, okay? So when you look at this, one of the things is, is this image can be overwhelming. There's a lot going on. And as an artist, I wanna to learn to use my eye to compose an image that invites people in to look at the subject that has engaged my heart and mind. So I simply love these two, these, these two right here on the bottom. I all, there's several things I love about them. They're similar, but they're different. This one has the beautiful red and green contrast. This one has a much, much brighter green with these lovely red tips on it. And of course the smaller, the little babies are a bright, bright red. So there's a beautiful essay and contrast going on here. And yet they're all unified because they're different greens and reds. Then we have a lovely contrasting red here, and then these beautiful cool greens in the background. But as I said, it's really just a snapshot of what's in my pot. What I wanna create is a work of art, and that means that I'm going to have to change the reality just a little bit. So what I did was when I traced it, and let me put this in the back so you can see it a little bit better. I'm gonna bring that down. You're gonna notice that I did trace both of those, both of those cacti that I liked very much. And I also included that beautiful branching red, uh, branching red succulent that I had and these bright green succulents. But I introduced another succulent that I had on another part of the pot. I introduced this piece here because it was this nice kind of cool blue green but it completes my composition to be a lovely triangle. The human eye loves odd numbers for composition, and it also loves triangles because diagonals are interesting. So we've created not only a dynamic diagonal here, but we've also created a, uh, a, a three points of focus, one, two, and three, and we look in the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. So we're moving around and in to the piece. So a little bit on composition there to help you get started to think about 
how you're going to take those pictures, and then how you take a simple snapshot and make it into a work of art. Now, how do I get my cartoon, my coloring book picture, onto my page? Well, you've probably guessed it. This is the this is the old uh, this is the old grade school trick. Okay, I just took my soft pencil, my my uh, two B pencil, and I scribbled it all over the back. And for those of you like me who remember carbon paper. That's basically what you're doing is you're making transfer paper or carbon paper. I cover the back thoroughly with that pencil, that soft pencil that likes to, that likes to blend and likes to smudge. And then you'll notice that I've made a note of where my corners are so I can center it up nicely on my page. And then I took just any old bright colored pencil and I traced my drawing. Now, why do this with a bright colored pencil? Because then you know where you've traced and you won't get lost. And you take that off and then you have a beautiful light drawing that you're ready to get started. Now, when you're tracing, okay, tracing can be a valuable, valuable tool because as you trace over using your tracing paper, and I'm gonna use the bottom of this here, I want you to be tracing fully conscious, thinking about what is the structure of the, that plant? How are all these parts related to each other? And then also think about the shapes, not only of the parts of the plant and the plant overall, but look at the shapes of the colors, look at the shapes of the darks. Look, can we have a dark area down here and look at the shapes of the lights and draw those in for yourself. This will train your eye. Don't, don't trace blindly, just sort of not thinking about anything. Make this a very, very deliberate and mindful process so that you're learning from your tracing and then your tracing will inform your drawing. So I hope that helps. Okay, some of our some of our folks who are just getting started with, with learning how to draw. Now, for those of you who are already taking the plunge and learning how to draw, I'm gonna bring my, my little buddies back here. And you're gonna, and I'm going to show you how I would get started drawing one of the succulents. So let me pull this out, okay, and I'm gonna work. This way, I'm gonna turn this page. We'll come back to that page because we're gonna talk about our color. Now, when I wanna draw, and hopefully you have your, your plants next to you. Maybe some of you have some succulents in the house. One of the things that I'm going to do, so I see this a little more rather than just a bird's eye view, I'm gonna tip it gently and put something, maybe even a little pile of pencils just underneath there, there we go. So now I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my, my drawing here. And what I've decided is, is I wanna draw these cacti that, or these succulents that are right here, okay? And when I notice, I want them to be, I'm gonna start by, I notice that uh, I'm gonna draw it life size since it's small. And my composition is longer than it is taller. So I'm going to orient my page in such a way that it's in landscape. So my longest axis is my horizontal axis and my shorter axis is the vertical axis. So I'm going to create the first thing and I'm going to be drawing, okay, not with, I know it's very tempting, I'm not going to draw with my drawing pencil. What I'm going to be drawing with is I'm going to draw with very, very lightly with my uh, with my olive green. Now you might ask like, well, why would you start with that color? Well, there's a little bit of olive green in all of this. And so this is what I would call my, my, my most prevalent local color. So I'm gonna work very, very lightly. I'm gonna create a datum line. So I'm gonna, which means I'm gonna create like a little baseline. I'm gonna work lightly. 
And you're going to say, how did she draw a straight line? Well, because all I did was drag my hand across the edge of the page, and then I just kept the pencil still, and I was able to draw a nice straight line. So I'm going to take a moment there that we got. We know where we're going to be putting our our cacti. I, I'm going to put the limit, or I'm sorry, my succulents here. I keep using those words interchangeably. Sorry, and then I have that there, and I know about how tall they're going to be. I'm literally measuring with my fingers. You can see. I know how tall they're going to be, how wide is, and now I don't have to be concerned about anything running off of my page. Now, I'll take a moment, a quick moment to stop. Libby, do we have any questions? There was one question that came in that has to do a little bit with coloration and shading. So I don't know if you want me to ask that now or later. You know, we're going to get to that. So if, if, if you be, if you, if you, I um, hold on to it until you get to it. How about that? That would be super. That would be okay. super. So now how I'm going to get started is I'm going to locate, I've located my extremities, okay? And so I know what my picture is. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to locate the, lar the two largest objects that I have, or at least, or the largest objects that I have. And I'm going to measure where they come and let me pull back out so you can see my fingers. I'm going to measure, That's that was my imaginary point here. I'm going to measure over to the center. So I know my center for that one is right about there. And I'll measure back here. And my center for that one is right about there. And now I'm going to start to put them in. I'm literally measuring their diameters with my fingers and centering those diameters on that. And when I look at them, I'm looking for the big shape. And the big shape that I see here is a kind of elliptical shape. Now remember that elliptical shape is because of the perspective. I know that from the bird's eye view, these are quite round, but I'm gonna put in that elliptical shape. Notice that I'm working very lightly I do not want, but I also want to make sure that I get a little bit of that angle. These are not facing each other. They're actually kind of cuddled up against, their backs are kind of cuddled up against each other. And now I'm going to start to put in those smaller pieces. See, once I have these larger ones in, then I put in these smaller, these smaller elements of the plant. And I can do them so that they look proportionally correct. I can measure them literally, but once I get the big pieces in, I can just put them in. Now, let me zoom down so you can see what that basic drawing looks like. It's nothing. It's just a series of eggs and circles. Yeah, you know, and that drawing is sideways for us. Oh, that, uh, okay. That's, uh, let me try to turn. Is that better? Yes. Thank okay, you. Okay, there we go. Wonderful. Okay. So now you can draw eggs in circles. I know you can. Okay. So that's, that's, that's not a problem. Notice that I put these little axial lines here to remind me which way their centers are facing, okay? So you can do that for your plant. The next thing that I like to do is I like to put where that inner circle is, that inner elliptical, those are where, that's kind of an imaginary, it's actually, you have to use your imagination when you draw so much because that's going to be this area here. That's that. Let me pull back up a little bit more. I don't want you to get so far away from my drawing. You can't see it. I'm going to, that's where all these little tips make a circle. I'm going to put that in. And of course, it's elliptically shaped because it's in perspective. So I'm going to put those in. And now what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to start to draw, I'm going to find a major, I'm going to find a nice major leaf, okay, and I'm going to 
I'm going to put that in, right? And that's going to be like my home base on that. I'm going to draw that and I'm keeping just the basic shape. Now I'm going to put in this one. This one very conveniently is right on the center line. And then I'm going to begin to build this out, to overlap it. Now, as you're drawing these, I want you to notice there, there is a logic to the plant and to its structure. These plants, in fact, are Fibonacci plants. So that Nautilus shell spiral, you're actually going to see in this plant many, many cacti and succulents are our Fibonacci plants. We'll see that, that seashell spiral in all of their parts. It's really, really amazing. And so now you'll notice- Mary Ellen, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, would you mind zooming in just a little bit so you can see your sketch? Thank you. So I'm gonna zoom in, there we go. And now I'm gonna begin, I'm on, I'm going to, you're going to notice that I'm just putting in basic, very, very basic leaf shapes. I'm not worried about, I have my individual, that one first individual one, okay? And um, and then I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm not going to get so much detail here, okay, that this gets much, much, I don't want the drawing to get heavy on one side and be light on the other. We want to build the drawing up as we go along. So I'm going to find that key, that, that one key point on my, and I'm going to begin to sketch in and sketch all around. Creating that, that wonderful, and it, they're just, they're so, they have like this whole little world going on, all of them. And then, of course, this one, the, they're starting to lie down, but notice that I use There we go. And so we'll get the basic shape there. Now I'll move on. I'm, I'm, I apologize for moving so quickly, but our time together is short. And you can, you can just today, you know, get as far as you can, you know, and maybe even you want to just stop and just do one part of the plant. Then I'm going to begin to fill all of the rest of this in. Now, hey, Mary Ellen, we had yeah. a question. So yeah. when, you're, when you're working on this drawing, are you specific about drawing every leaf and petal that you see, or do you draw something approximately if it's not integral to identifying the plant? You know, that's a great question. Um, I would say that, you know, you do, you actually do draw most of what you see, but what's most important, I mean, don't, don't be, you know, don't be beating yourself up with your pencil. Um, you know, uh, what's most important is that you capture what I like to call the habit or the personality of the plant. So you'll notice that, and let me pull out just a little bit here so you can see the one. So this one you'll notice lays down a little bit more, okay, than this one does. This one is much, much the, the, uh, the, the leaves are much, much more up 
upright. And then this one is much more relaxed and open than the other one. So I try to capture that kind of feel for it. The same thing with, so for example, if we'll get, use another plant here, this plant here, notice that all of the leaves, the, they, the tops start to curve as the head of the, of the plant kind of curves down. So they sort of go with it rather than, you know, it's not a very straight and up, you know, perfectly straight upright plant like that. So, you know, you try to get its personality, the way it, its habit of the way the leaves lay on, you know, on the plant itself, rather than fussing about, you know, there's, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five. I mean, you know, you don't want to put too many in, but you also don't want to needle yourself if you've got, you know, 17 as opposed to 15. And, and Mary uh, Ellen, there's been a request also, if we could see the plant that you're working on while you're sketching, I don't yep. know if that's going to be possible to, with yeah, the, I can how do that. heavy or light you're, you're actually sketching, but thanks. There we go. I can pull that in just a little bit more there. There we go. And I'm going to keep it back because I'm afraid that the, I'm going to change. Give me one second. Let me bring my one lamp down. There we go. Now we've got a lot less shadow. I was concerned about the shadow. And there, okay. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Could zoom down a little. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, I one of the things that I've noticed here with this plant, okay, is that I've got a little bit of a, of a darker interior in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start to put in a bit of that shadow, that shape of that shadow on that plant and the how some of these different parts are casting shadows on other parts. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'm only putting in the darkest areas. And again, you're gonna notice I'm really keeping a light hand here. I am not, I'm not bearing down we're going to build this up slowly. Now, do keep, and I'm going to slow down here just one second. I want you to notice, I'm going to bring this up closer to the camera so you can see it. Okay, I want you to notice that I do keep a variation in the values so I don't lose my drawing. I don't lose track of what is where. Okay. So I'm going to keep building that up. Okay. And I'll bring this back down now and pull out so you can see the whole piece there. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to keep putting in those, those shadows. Now in here, do notice that I've got some darker here or here. And once I put all of my major shadows in, now these are the shapes and the backs of leaves that have that the back of the different areas here. I notice it's going to look kind of odd, but it starts looking strangely dimensional. You start getting a sense of, you know, what's going on with this plant. It starts having form. Value is, is really the, the, the thing that creates that illusion of form on a two-dimensional sur surface. So those changes in lights and darks are what our eye looks for to see, to, to identify a shape. So you can see it's starting to kind of come to life. Now what I'm going to do is, and this is going to seem absolutely crazy to some folks, but what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to I'm going to take my olive because this is my darker 
is my dark my darker succulent and i'm actually going to put a light layer of the color over the entire piece i'm going to color over all of those shadows that i did as well really important that you do that because you'll notice that just darkened them all down it made them even darker and that's perfect that's exactly what you want to do now normally okay if i'm working on this whole composition i would make sure that i went over and i did exactly the same thing over on this plant as well but you're going to notice something kind of fun i'm going to do this one put these put all of my shadows over here because we always want to work the whole composition you don't want to fall in love. It's so easy to fall in love with the details. Everybody loves to detail. Everybody loves to just dive in. You want to get out all the pencils and you want to get all those tips sharpened up and just jump right on in. But the problem with that is, is then, then your, your work will look unbalanced. So now I've, I've put my shadows in there, but because this cacti is much lighter than this one, I'm going to change from my olive to, I'm going to change to my spring green. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that spring green and I'm going to color over all of those olive marks that I put in that were shadows. Oops, looks like I missed a spot here. Need to put in a little bit right here. And you see, you know there, there are going to be some areas where I'm going to be adding that red. Okay. But I'm not because well, I'm Mary Ellen, quick yeah. question about that while you're doing this. Are mm -hmm. are you supposed to be staying within the outlines when you're kind of doing that all over shading, or does that matter? I tell you, we have some really sharp folks because I was just about to get to that. I've actually gone a little outside the lines, okay? And so now what I'm doing is I'm coming in with my pencil and I'm taking out those rough construction lines and some of the areas where I've overshot so I can keep so I can keep those little tips in there. Keep all of that. And now you're going to start to see that it gets a lot more defined with that. So I'm coming in with my eraser and sometimes I like using the white eraser a little bit because it sometimes it doesn't smudge quite as much. Sometimes they can, they can smudge. There we go. I have to say, it's kind of nice to be able to blow the eraser dust off of my drawing. Um, you know, when I've been teaching uh, in the classroom and we've had mask on, I would go and forget that I had a mask on and blow the try to blow the eraser dust off and it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so now here's the part that you've all been waiting for. Now I'm going to sharpen up this this olive, this, uh, I'm sorry, my spring green, and I'm going to get out my, my pomegranate, which is already nice. I've got a really nice sharp tip on that one. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm really going to start to pluck out those individual details. And when I put in very lightly, and let me zoom down a little bit. So we're going to lose my, we're going to lose the uh, subject just a little, okay? Mary Ellen, I think because you have that large plant to the left of the image, the uh, screen is, is focused on that, uh, oh. the actual live plant there. So if you want to move, gonna, can, there we go. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to move them back. <laughs> <laughs> They're camera hogs, aren't they? They just, they, they, they want the, they want the spotlight. <laughs> So now I am going to start to pay attention to all those little individual details. And I'm going to 
start to very, very lightly put in the tips. And you can see when I, let me bring this down even closer so you can see it. When I come in with that spring green, I'm actually running up into the red just a bit. And then as I come down with that spring green, I'm, you notice there's a little shadow on the bottom here. I'm going to come in with some of the olive. I mean, this is where you, you, you start drawing where kind of holding multiple pencils. And now from here, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my slate blue and you're going to see there's a, a fun little trick we can do here. I can do this one of two ways, but for our purposes, I think today using the slate blue might be the way to go here. I'm going to bring that blue in. Oh, and look at that. That's got just the effect that I want. See how it just cooled down that area there. And now all of a sudden, that part of the plant is just coming alive for us. It's really, really starting to, to be what we're drawing. There we go. And then I'm going to add a little more. And you'll notice I'm going to just keep switching back and forth here. And then as I get deeper down into that shadow, okay, I can also, I'm going to bring more and more of that blue in that's going to cool that down. And it gives that, gives that some depth in that area. So really, really interesting the way that works. Now, sometimes, one of the things that's kind of fun to do is we can create little highlights. So this is a this is a little bit normally I would wait to do my highlights. I want to show you all how we can do that. I would wait till I got the whole thing done. But I'm gonna come in with a very, very sharp white. And I'm going to put in, it's not nice. We get that real edge going on there. There's another one right here. Oops. Oh, see, that's why you don't want to press too hard. And then I'm going to run over here. Little, little dark. Right here. I'm gonna work around. Notice I'm working, I'm being very careful working around that little white highlight that I made. And one of the things that another thing besides diagonals and odd numbers that the human eye loves, loves contrast. Right where I made that little dark next to that light, your eye wants to go right to that. And so, you know, you're going to spend a lovely afternoon just falling into the world that is this, this tiny, complex plant that's, you know, that we, you know, we see them in the garden center or, you know, in Target or something, and we don't really look at them. And... There's a whole world going on. All of this mathematics, all of this beauty, and they're just they're just doing great without us paying attention to them, but we're missing so much. Now, right down here, it's quite dark. Even darker than my blue can help me with. So what I'm going to do right there is, you notice I, I, I put my red in, which is the opposite of my green. Now I'm overlaying that green 
on top. Oh, look at that. That's very nice. Now, if that seems a little a little warm because the red warmth of the red is coming through, then let's just strengthen that blue that's part of the green a little bit there. There we go. And look, we got a very, very dark area there right now. Now I'm gonna hold this up to the camera or actually let me bring that camera down just a little bit more and see if I can there we go I want you to really be able to see that and to do that now as I said I started working on this area doing a little more detail than I probably normally would have started in one particular area I would have you know if our time together wasn't so short I would I would go ahead and put all of these little tips all over so that we get everything to, to to the same level each time. And we always know kind of where we're going then. You can start to see the structure of the plant. Mary Ellen, while you're working on this and working on sort of the coloring, um, can I ask you, is, is the term saturation the same as shade? Oh, so that's, that's, that. that's a great question. Okay, so saturation has to do with, and it's in colored pencils in particular, has to do with, so for example, and I'll do this right at the bottom of the page, and I'll use the red. So this would be, this would be the hue, right? But it's a low saturation. We can't see that, Mary Ellen. Oh. So oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, my cell phone camera has slightly more uh, than the, uh, the, the the when it comes over on the uh, on the digitally. But see, when I when I build up that color, okay, you're going to notice that it becomes more intensely red, and that's uh, literally more pigment. It's the same hue but it's more pigment of the hue so it's a greater saturation or a greater intensity of the color so so in colored pencil we're really talking about how much layering you've done of the same color um, and one of the things too that i want you to notice that i have not done i have not bared down on any of this at all but what i will do as time goes on and I'll use this area in here that I've been working on. Let's get just a little, just a little more, a little wider area here. So we have a little more sense of, of the plant. And then there would be areas that I would come in with my blender and what I would do is I would want to create a little bit kind of shine where I'm just going to select certain areas. I'm actually using a bit of pressure here, blending that out. And then I might even come back in, add just one more little touch on top of the blended area and work. There, but I wouldn't do it everywhere, maybe just on the tips, okay, to give it that little bit of glossiness and smoothness. Interestingly enough, these, these particular succulents that I have as examples, when you look at them closely, you're, you're going to notice that they're actually more of a matte finish rather than a gloss finish. They really don't have that sort of gloss that like tropical leaves have to them they actually almost have like a little bit of it almost seems like they have a little bit of fuzz and that's what that's what i mean by they don't but that's what i mean by a matte finish on them see how that plant's starting starting to come to life here's going to be another dark area here i'm going to Right down here, I'm going to add some of that red. I know that seems counterintuitive, but I'm going to come in with the darker green. 
And look at that. Look how that just turns green for us. Now, you might have asked yourself, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to use black. Well, I'll tell you why you don't want to use black. And black just, you know, it's funny. As I said that, I went and just very quickly looked in my box of colored pencils. I have about 200 colored pencils in a, in a box, in a wooden box next to me. And I just realized that I don't even have a black. Um, the reason why I don't use black is the black pigment overwhelms everything. And it, it, simply, it, it, it simply just flattens everything out. You know, you have to imagine like, you know, when we actually, when we're looking at things, we're seeing colors and light reflecting. So we, we very seldom actually see anything that's purely black. What we, what we really are seeing are, are all these darker shades. Oh, here's a fun spot here for a little, little bit of a white highlight right on the ridge there. I'm going to put that in. And then I, 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 I hope all of you are making all kinds of fun discoveries like that as you're going along. I know when you look at cacti and succulents or even, you know, I, I, I love botanicals, even the, the dreaded hydrangea, you know, compound flowers and things. It can seem so overwhelming. But again, you know, you're going to always want to start with those big shapes and then break it, look for that structure and then break that down to the just break it down to the smaller and smaller shapes, and then it's not nearly as overwhelming as it as it first seems to be. And as I mentioned before, when we get started, you know, if a subject seems overwhelming to you, even if you have experience drawing from life, take a picture of it. Also, you know, with phones being so available now and being able to take pictures and things, I, I take pictures of my subjects all the time when I'm drawing from life because you never know when you're going to, uh, you know, something's going to move, you're going to have to leave. And then when you get back to the studio and you have that quiet moment, you're going to want to sit down and, and, and you're going to want that reference picture to work from. And if you don't understand something, trace it. You know, when I first learned to drive, my father gave me a cutaway of a car engine and a piece of tracing paper and a pencil, and he made me trace the car engine. And to this day, I have a, I, you know, I, I couldn't fix my own car, but I have a pretty good fundamental knowledge of of how it works and what goes where, because he, he kept telling me, it's not a magic carpet. You don't just put your key in and magic happens. It's like you have to understand how the machine works. And, uh, you know, I like I said, plants can be like that too. This is understand, take that time to understand how they work and that will inform your drawing beautifully. See how I'm building up here. Now you might have noticed that spending a little more time doing the detail here in the foreground. And this just makes sense. You always want to have a little more drama in your, in your values, a little more intensity in your color, a little more detail all that in the foreground because that's where you know you want your viewer's eye to look and you notice i'm i'm constantly switching pencils
and looking for those opportunities to create these little areas of contrast. So our, our little buddy here, these smaller, the little offshoots here are much, much lighter. So I'm gonna start to block in some of that. I didn't do that earlier. But since we're we're focused on this one little corner here, I'll I'll finish this part out here. So you can get the sense it's it's very tight in here. I'm actually gonna sharpen up my pencil here. And what I'm gonna do is this little area in here, they're they're very tight. Oops, they're very close together. The the uh they haven't this portion of the plant is where everything's emerging from. Oh, and this brings a great, oh, this brings a great point up. I'm having difficulty with my pencil right now, but as uh, this is something that I wanted to mention to you, um, try not to drop your colored pencils. Um, they are brittle and you can actually break the lead in inside the wooden barrel. And if you ever have that problem where you're sharpening and it breaks and you're sharpening and it breaks, that's actually what happens. You're just gonna have to sharpen past that point uh, because there's a crack somewhere in the barrel and you're gonna just need to work your way past that. Now I'm gonna come in here a little bit of just touching that with a little bit of that slate blue and a little bit of the olive. Look at that. We've created that center in there already. It's so much fun. And this part up here has just a little, little bit of the olive in here because they're leaning back and casting just a bit of shadow in there so here fill in some of these areas but then this lower part is going to be very very nice and bright in here that's catching the light you always want to pay attention to where the light is where it's coming from I'm going to put just a, a little bit of color over that whole piece. Probably won't have to erase anything out of here. Maybe just from the side here a bit. And I'm going to come in with this. And look at that. We're going to start to get I'm in with the red in a minute. This is a this is working for us right now. A little bit that blue showing through, a little too blue. I'm going to put just a bit of green over top. See, that's the other thing that's so terrific about colored pencil is a e Unless the, really the only mistake that you can make is the bearing down. That's very, very difficult to, if you get that, um, if you, you end up, and I'll show you if so, if I come in here and I really, really, let's, let me overwork a portion. I come in and I, I bear down hard 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 right here like this oh boy look at that look at the difference between that and and this up here this is very very flat very very overworked and now if i come in and i want to mix that red in there it's going to be super super hard to mix that in it's it's gonna it's just gonna keep getting shinier and flatter and we're gonna and it just ends up being a really really dark blotch area and 
And if we, the same thing can happen if you overuse, oops, I'm, you can see how hard I'm pressing if I overuse the white. Once again, it just starts looking smudgy. Okay, we really don't want that. Or if you overuse the blender, the blender is very tempting to overuse. And it just, you just start losing the life of it. I mean, compare the work up here to these splotches here. They're not nearly as interesting. Mary, right. as, Mary Ellen, just yes. two things. One, we have about five minutes left. I know yes. it goes so quickly. Um, but also there's a question here. Someone was asking about composition. Oh, um, yeah. When you're, when you're, when you're creating these drawings and mm -hmm. is it best for the light to come in from the upper left? Oh, that's a great question. I love telling, I love when people ask this question. So generally, yes, you want the light to come from the upper left hand corner. Okay. Uh, however, if you are a lefty, you want it to come from the upper right hand corner because you will notice that uh, I have two lights on right now. And in order to enhance the view um, when we're when we're online, but uh, were I working on my own, I would only have my left hand light on because then that way I would not be casting a shadow. You can see I cast a shadow onto my own work when I'm working. Also, too, when I'm making shadows, I'm I'm working away. I'm not dragging my hand over my shadow. So the same thing would happen if I were lefty. It would be easier to work this way, that this is the darker side over here. You know, I'd be working that way. So you want to keep that in mind. Yes, the upper left-hand corner. Now go to the museum and have some fun the next time and see if you can find out which painters were lefties. Now not all you know not all situations it's not always a hundred percent true but particularly for still life when you go to see like you know these these uh you know uh 16th century dutch still lifes you're going to be able to tell who was the left hand artist and who was the right hand artist by the way they set up the light in their in their still life though the the left-handed ones the light will be coming from the right because it was much easier to, to paint that way much more logical for them to paint that way and the same thing is true for the right-handed artists the light will be coming from the left hand side so it's kind of a fun thing it's a great question and and to that end too you want to always simplify your light source if you can um, when you take a picture of your plants um, you know, put them on a desk with a blank background. And if you look on my website, I actually do have um, advice about taking your own pictures. But just in a nutshell, you know, put them on your desk with a blank background, put a piece of paper up on the wall or something like that. And then, um, and then what you'll want to do is um, you'll, you you want to just have one light source so that your shadows are all from one from one side. And so and it also too, even in a situation like this, it would be very nice to make some shadows. So say I'll just for the sake here and turn this area, create a little bit of shadow here. I'm going to start with that pale, pale blue. I'll fade it out. Cast shadows are always darkest closest to the object. These are the plants are casting the shadows. I'm going to make it very intense and then I'm going to fade it out around there. I'm going to add a little bit of the green because in our shadows, there's always a bit of the color of what I like to call the local color, that, that color that's sort of all around. I'm going to put that in. And then in this case, I would actually get a darker blue um, that I could use here. This one is a nice blue gray. I would blend that in. Create a little bit of shadow 
on my pot maybe. Fade that out. Maybe I'd even start to, I have some ochre colors. Maybe I'm gonna actually even imply a little bit of the pot. Tend not to draw the pot. It's nicer when you fade things. Gives them a little bit of a little warmth. And you have kind of what's referred to as a vignette, little scene. Going to make, I'm going to cool this down just a bit. Hey, Marianne, as you're finishing that up, um, I just want to say we have reached uh, one o'clock again. Okay. Crazy uh, how, how time flies. It is. <laughs> it absolutely is. There you go. So I have my pot kind of implied there and do that and I'll, I'll make sure that i post this for people so they can see kind of a work in progress as mm -hmm. well and then here i guess i can come back I, let me let me yeah see. I, i'll i'll come back now there we go <laughs> hello hello Hi. Um, i just want to thank you very very much